Here we're going to continue trying to understand what complex numbers have to do with RCL circuits. Remember, RCL circuits have inductors, resistors, and capacitors. Remember that an inductor usually has some associated resistance in with it, and usually they're hooked up to a voltage varying source, V of the source, and the opposition to the current created by the source is reacted to by the inductor and the capacitor, therefore the opposition to the current for an inductor and a capacitor typically is called reactance. Now, they will have an overall opposition to the current which is called impedance, so we're going to try and find the impedance of the circuit, but to do that we're going to find the impedance of each of the three components on the circuit right here. So we're going to find the impedance of the inductor that includes the resistance, we're going to find the impedance of the resistor, we're going to find the impedance of the capacitor. But keep in mind that because they tend to oppose the current, and they tend to oppose the current of the, of the voltage source at different times in the phase of the oscillating voltage, we have to keep in mind that in order to express them correctly, we have to use a real and imaginary part to the reactants and to the impedance in each case. So let's go ahead and let's start doing that. First of all, we have the impedance of the inductor, and that is always equal to the sum of the resistance of the inductor plus the reactance of the inductor, but the reactance is out of phase with the resistance by 90 degrees, so we have to use the imaginary part of that complex number I. So if we now plug the numbers in, and I didn't yet tell you how to find these, I just gave you that this was 50 ohms and this was 80 ohms. Later on, in some later videos, I will show you how we actually calculate these numbers because they do depend on the source and the frequency of the source. If the frequency of the source changes, these numbers will change. So these are definitely dependent upon the frequency of the source. So for this particular source, with this particular frequency, we'll take the values as they are. So let's plug them in. So in this case, that will be equal to 20 ohms plus, because in the case of an inductor, it, the, the opposition to the current leads the opposition to the current for the, for the capacitor, and so therefore the voltage drop across the inductor happens first, then the voltage drop across the resistor, and then the voltage drop across the capacitor. So we have a plus an imaginary part, and it would be 50 ohms in this case. So that would be the total impedance of the inductor with its own internal resistance to the opposition. Uh, uh, total impedance to the current, I should say, because impedance is, of course, opposition. For the resistor, that's easy. The resistor doesn't have an imaginary part. It is in phase with the, with the source, so therefore it only has a real part. And so we can say that the impedance of the resistor simply is the resistance, plus it will be zero imaginary parts. So that's simply equal to 20 ohms, and there's no imaginary part for the resistor. For the capacitor, capacitor will lag because the capacitor can absorb quite a bit of current before it begins to fill up with charge, before it begins to oppose the, uh, the current flow. So the, volta the voltage uh, drop across the capacitor uh, happens after the voltage drop across the resistor and the voltage drop across the inductor. So it actually lags and therefore we have a negative imaginary part to this. So this will be equal to, that would be the uh, zero because it doesn't have a resistance associated with it, minus I times, and then of course would be the uh, capacitor, the reactance of the capacitor. So I'll write X sub C, I'll write X sub L here because that's the, the reactance of the inductor, here's the reactance of the capacitor, and so this would be equal to zero ohms for the real part minus, and in this case we said it was going to be 80 ohms. All right, so those are the impedances of those three components. Now if we want to find the total impedance, we simply add the three impedances together. So in this case, this is equal to the impedance of the inductor plus the impedance of the resistor plus the impedance of the capacitor, and so if we do that, we get uh, that would be here 20 ohms for the real part plus 50 ohms for the imaginary part. Uh, then we add to that plus 20 ohms for the resistor and then we subtract from that 80 ohms for the capacitor. But of course for the capacitor that will be an imaginary part that will be minus 80i. So notice we can now add, this, add these together. So we have 20 plus 20. That would be 40. Did I make that? Oh no, I didn't make that 20. I made that 60 ohms. Sorry about that, I made a mistake here, that should be 60, and this here, that should be 60. So that would be 20 ohms plus 60 ohms, that would be 80 ohms for the real part of the total impedance, and then plus 50 minus 80 minus 30, and I should put an I in there, 
because it's an imaginary part, 30 ohms for the imaginary part, and that would be the total impedance of the circuit. Right there. Now, if we're going to graph that out, so to hopefully make that a um, little bit more clear, let's draw what we would call a phasor type, type diagram, where we indicate the opposition to the current, how it occurs in phase, in time. So for the resistor, it's going to occur at the same time as the voltage source, so we're going to have a plus 60 ohms for the resistance, which is of course also the total impedance of the resistance. For the inductor, we have a real part and we have an imaginary part. We have a plus 20 real part and a plus 50 imaginary part. So let's say that's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. And so we have 20 and 50 combined. So this would be the representation, the impedance of the inductor, which has a real part of 20 ohms and an imaginary part of 50 ohms. So that would be 50, so plus I times 50 ohms. So that would be the impedance of the, of the inductor. This would be the resistance of the resistor. And now we have to come up with the impedance of the capacitor. Now notice that the capacitor only has reactance to the current. There's no resistive part to it, and it's minus 80. So that's minus 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 down here. So it'll be minus 80. And so this would be the representation of the impedance or the reactance of the, of the capacitor, Z sub L, which of course we can also write X sub L because in this case, the Z, oop, not L, this is capacitor, C. There we go, C. So in this case, we can say that the impedance of the capacitor is the same as the reactance of the capacitor. As far as the impedance of the, of the um, inductor, we can say it's the sum of the reactance of the inductor, which is 50 ohms. Let me write it over here. So X sub L is equal to 50 ohms right there. And then, of course, we have a real part to it right there. So this would be R sub L that would be equal to 20 ohms. So if we had the real part of the resistance of the inductor and the imaginary part, the reactance of the inductor together, we get the impedance of the inductor. Here we have the 60 ohms resistance of the resistor. And here we have the minus 80 why is it minus? Because it's behind in time. So notice that this whole thing kind of rotates around like this. That's kind of what we call a phase diagram. So you can see that they take their turn reaching a maximum value in the real direction as time goes by. But at this point, relative to the resistor, we know that we are 90 degrees behind. And so therefore, we can say that the X sub C is equal to minus 80 in the I direction, or just for the magnitude of it, it's minus 80. Um, of course, we really don't talk about X sub C being a negative value because it's kind of like a vector. Vectors uh, sticking out don't have negative values, so to speak. They just have negative directions. So you can just see that X sub C is 80 in the negative direction, and we can call that ohms as well like that. Okay, so that would be the best way to represent it. Now, what would be the total impedance? Well, here's the total impedance. If we now do a vector sum of these three components, or these three impedances, we would take this impedance, we take this impedance and we take this impedance and we do like a vector sum because when we do complex numbers, it's almost like using vectors. If we add those three together, we will get this as a result. And notice if I were to draw that, it would be 80 ohms in the, in the real direction and 30 ohms in the imaginary direction. So if we go out another two like this, this would be 80. And then we go one, two, three, minus 30 in the imaginary part and we connect those two up then we can see that this is the total impedance, Z total, which is simply a sum of the impedance of the inductor, the impedance of the resistor, and the impedance of the capacitor added together. And that would be the total impedance of the whole circuit, and that's how we figure that out. So we add the real parts together, and we add, add the imaginary parts together to come up with the total uh, inductance. Now I still have this here, right here, reactance. Remember, what is the reactance again? The reactance is simply the opposition to the current for the inductor, only the inductor portion, and for the capacitor. So in this case, we can say that the reactance, X sub L, is equal to 50 ohms. And we can say that the X sub C, the reactance of the capacitor, is equal to 80 ohms. Knowing full well that this will be 90 degrees behind in phase, and this will be 90 degrees ahead in phase, 
but simply expressing the amount. We don't put an I in front of it. We simply say that there's 50 ohms of reactance for the inductor, 80 ohms of reactance for the capacitor. We know that the reactance for the inductor will be 90 degrees ahead. The reactance for the capacitor will be 90 degrees behind, so that they're actually 180 degrees apart from one another. If we now want to find the total reactance, x total, we have to add these two up. But again, in this case, we have to take into account that this will be in the positive direction, this will be in the negative direction, so it'll be 50 ohms for the x sub L minus 80 ohms for the x sub C, so that would be minus 30 ohms. So when you find the total reactance, x total, it's simply equal to x sub L minus x sub C, minus because we know it's going to be negative direction, so this is again 50 ohms minus 80 ohms, 50 ohms minus 80 ohms, which is minus 30 ohms of total reactance when we take the two combined. So hopefully you can see the relationship, why it's so convenient to use these complex numbers to indicate the opposition to the current in an RCL circuit. And we'll continue to develop this, but hopefully this will become very clear to you on how to use that.